Hey everybody, it's Jason. Welcome or welcome back to the Mosaic Church Podcast. At the end of this podcast, please take a moment to connect with us on social media. It's a great place to learn more and to see what's happening at Mosaic. Most importantly, hope the following message encourages and inspires you to take a new step on your faith journey. Enjoy. So if you are just joining us, uh, last week we started our adventure into the Lord's Prayer, and we kicked off this series, and we explored this really big, huge idea. And this idea is, how in the world are we supposed to pray? And what we explored and learned from each other as we were processing this is that most of us are terrified, terrified of the idea of praying, especially praying out loud. And I shared this story of being in this large group of super high-level theologians, it seems, and they were praying, and they're using all these big words, and it came around to me, and I was terrified because I didn't want to sound stupid, I didn't want to sound like I didn't know anything about prayer, and I was so intimidated to be in this group of people who were using words that were like, just, (laughs) I had never heard of them before, and then I, and I said, and then my friend next to me starts his prayer with, hey, dad, and I'm like, you can't say that. You can't say, hey, dad. Like, I mean, you can't say. And I don't remember what I prayed. I remember my friend said, hey, dad. And this beautiful, simple prayer started to talk to his heavenly father. And I started to realize is that prayer is something that just doesn't seem to make sense to us. It doesn't seem to make sense because in one sense, like depending on our experience, we don't know really what to do with words and what to say. We get intimidated, like, am I saying the wrong thing? Am I asking the wrong thing? And honestly, we don't really teach or talk a lot about prayer. But at the same time, we look at Jesus, who is always praying. And so this is the, the tension that we're exploring last week. And then we got into what Jesus starts with this prayer. He saw, starts with what we are not supposed to do. And he says this, first things first, what you're not supposed to do is create prayer to be a big show where everybody's looking at you. And he was speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees who would go to the synagogue and they would pray and they would chant these large, huge, beautiful prayers in front of everybody. So everyone would walk by like, oh, he is so spiritual. Oh, he is so close with God. And so Jesus says, if you do this for a show, you have received what you've wanted already. You've already got the glory that you were seeking. You got it by the way that you're praying and showing off for everyone. Now, I'm willing to say at Mosaic Church, we don't really necessarily suffer with that as much as we suffer with, I'm not saying anything out loud, pastor, you pray. How do I know? I went to lunch with some of you, and you all look at me when it's time to pray. (laughs) It's time to pray, pastor. I go to weddings, it's time to pray, pastor. You know you can pray too, right? But, we, but we're terrified. We're, we don't, we're not more of the showboating. We're just terrified. We're more like that big circle of people because we don't know how to. We've had bad experiences. And we've gone through things that say, I don't feel comfortable. This isn't a natural rhythm of my life. And so Jesus says, first of all, you are not to make a big show of this. And prayer is supposed to be intimate. Jesus shares I want you, when you pray, to go into your house, and I want you to go into a room. I want you to close the door so that nobody sees you. And then I want you to have an intimate relationship, an intimate conversation with your Father in heaven, and so that when you're praying, you're not going to fall victim to this showboating this. Now, I think this is a little bit more in our comfort and our culture range. Remember, cultures are different from Jesus' time 2,000 years ago in, in the East versus our time here in the West in the year 2024. However, when we pray, what do we say? What do we say? And we explored this question also. We said this, is he saying that we should never pray in a large group? He's not saying that. What he is saying is this, is that God knows the intention of your heart and why you are praying. So when I was in that big circle of scary people saying all those big words, I don't know the intentions of their heart. Were they trying to sound smart? Were they trying to like quote all these things I didn't understand? I don't know the intention of their heart, so that's not for me to judge. I don't know. All I know is that I was terrified that I sounded dumb, and so my heart was all messed up and gooey. So I was messed up in my heart. I don't know their intentions, but my heart wasn't right. 
And so what the whole thing Jesus is saying is that our prayer life, as we come to it, is about your heart, your heart and your intention. So when you enter into prayer, Jesus shares with us, enter into it with the correct motives. Okay, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good block for us to start on. And we also explore this other big, huge idea, and you're going to love this. You're going to love this. Because all of you who are terrified to pray, uh, it doesn't work anymore, because now you know this. You get to pray. You get to pray. I want you to memorize that. I want you to repeat that to each other, because if you've been around me long enough, you'll hear, no, 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 you get to pray. Big circle of people, who's going to pray? Everyone looks at me like, no, no, you all get to pray too. You get to speak to the God of the universe. Just think about this for a second. If we truly believe that God is this greater being, greater than ourselves, he is the God of everything created, he's the one who set a plan in motion in which he saved a broken, messed up creation that chose sin over him, loved us more than anything in the world, Jesus comes, the Son of God now takes our punishment on the cross for those who accept him as Savior, now have eternal life through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus. You get to say, hey, how are you doing today? And you get to talk to him. We act like we're talking to our kindergarten teacher who just caught us cheating on a math test. We enter our prayer life like, um, I don't know what to say. And we like get skittish and scared and we start going internal and we're like, I don't want to have this conversation. So the question that we need to explore is, why don't you want to have this conversation? For some of us, it's our experiences. For some of us, we grew up in a religious grouping in which prayers were done by the guy in front, and they were recited. There's nothing wrong with beautiful recited prayers. Those are lovely things. Uh, maybe for your tradition, you were in the big scary circle, and people giggled when you prayed. Or maybe for you, your spiritual life is like, I have never even really thought prayer was effective because I've prayed for a lot of things and nothing's happened in my life. So for me, prayer is just feels like a wasted breath because God doesn't listen to me any other time anyways. So why should I pray now? For some of us, prayer is as important as breathing. If I can't breathe, I'm going to die. If I can't have this time with God, I feel my spiritual life is just withering and dying. And for some people, prayer is such an important piece of their life they can't function without it because this is their time to bring their anxiety, their requests, their concerns, their worship up to the living God. So let me just throw this crazy question on you for a second. And I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but let's just process as a culture. We, as an American culture, are the most non-Christian of all time. We are a post-Christian society, uh, which means that we aren't praying but anxiety is the highest thing in every young person to old person's life right now. Anxiety, worry. And the Bible says, do not be anxious about anything, but with prayer and petition, bring your requests before God. And so we are supposed to be praying and we get to talk to the God of the universe and we get to have time with him. But if we are not a praying people, I wonder why we're so anxious, worried, scared, tense. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not dumb here, guys. I know that this is a real condition. I understand that anxiety is a real thing. I'm not saying and saying, oh, just pray about it. That's not what I'm saying. Don't hear me say that. What I'm saying is this. Is our prayer life at least starting to mirror the strength of the things we're worried about in our lives? Can those things be mirrored? And I'm going to tell you, here's my, I always confess my sins to you because I assume you, you are terrible like me. Here's my problem. I worry about everything first because I'm a fixer, a driver. That's how God made me. Do you even figure this out yet? Like, I'm a CEO. Let's build things. Let's grow. Let's go. Let's go. And I do not like to slow down to pray because prayer slows down my advancement of what's in my mind. Then I get overwhelmed. Then I get anxious. And I said, oh, hey, by the way, God, can we talk about this? How backwards is this prayer life? And literally the last few months, I have been engaging a different style of prayer in my own life. So when I challenge us to grow in our prayer life, I'm challenging my life as well to slow down and pray. That is very hard for Jason the jackrabbit. It is very hard to get my mind to stop thinking of the 17 new advancements I'm dreaming of 
to say, can I just talk to you for a while? But that's what God is calling me into and he's calling us into is that we get to pray. It is not a burden. It is not slowing the jackrabbit down. What it is, is it's me connecting to my father and having time and intimate relationship with the one who loves me so much and made me the way that I am. He made me the way that I am. He made the guy in me who likes to build, 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 go, go, go. I know some of you are like, man, I'm tired just listening to this dude. I understand that. I like to go. And when I drink coffee, man, y'all get Sunday morning coffee, Jason. It's awesome. (laughs) And I just like to go. But prayer in my life actually heals my soul, and I can do more. I can do more when I slow down and pray. You get to pray. And so now we're going to dig into our passage. We're in Matthew 6, 9. It's a super short sentence in your Bibles and Bible apps. You can join in us. We started first with what Jesus said and how not to pray. That was last week. Now we're going into our first part of Jesus' prayer of how to pray. If you've gone through the Lord's Prayer before and have heard this and are comfortable with it, most uh, Christian Americans have at least heard it, we're going to break this down and we're going to talk about words. Words. So what a word means, because we go, we flip through it, and so I want you to listen intently to how we break words down in this uh, beautiful beginning sentence and each one through our series, words matter. Words matter. Okay, we're going to start with our very first two words, super easy, our Father. When I started this study, I have never thought of this before. Why doesn't he say, my Father? I was like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's, he's my Father. I'm talking to my Father. And Jesus is teaching to a group of people, right? He's teaching to a Jewish audience of that time. And the Jewish audience is there listening. And he says, when you pray, I want you to say this. Our Father. Our Father. Our Father is a communal word. Our Father is not about a possessive sense. It's not limited to a small group of people. It is saying that I, if you are with me as God's people, it is a we conversation. You are part God of something bigger, and there's a bigger family than just little me. Our Father does such a beautiful thing in getting the focus off of ourself and onto what he wants to focus on, which is this. We are part of God's story and family that is bigger than ourself. He is our Father. Ephesians 4, 6 says this, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all. Listen to this again. There's one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all. Ephesians 4, 6 just gives us another statement. God isn't just about you. He's about us. And this is odd for us. Again, Western culture, we are so individualistic. We work for the best of myself, my family, my friends. It's always about me. And our Western culture drives individualism. Our capitalist way of thinking drives individual strength, growth, finances, money. We are about us, about me versus us. But the Eastern culture was always about them. You think tribal, tribal. If you're in a tribe, you take care of the people who are in your tribe. It's not just your family, it's us. And so when you're thinking of a group of people, it's about their culture and their group. So our father, our, starts the words out with before any other prayer, understand this is not about you. It's about a bigger story. Now what's interesting about that is that God is father of all humanity, changes the way I think and I'm going to pray. Hey, Dad, our Father. Change that to, hey, my Father, can I get a new car? Can I get this? Can I get this? Can I get this? Can I get this? Will you heal this? Will you do this? Will you do this? And it's all about me. Change your mindset in prayer to begin with the word our, and our now says, I'm thinking what's best for us. Our. Does he love you? Yes, he loves you. But guess what? He loves me too. And he loves us. And a small word like that, which took me time, I read it and I stopped. I started flipping through pages of people smarter than me who've written books. I'm like, 
I don't really, this kind of grinds my stomach a little bit because I never really thought of it like that. I've always entered prayer with the intention that I'm spending time with God, which is true. But my approach to prayer is that I'm spending time with my Father, who is part of all of this. Our Father. Communal. Some teachers and preachers are going to teach and say things such as, God wants the best for you, which is a which is a truth concerning his kingdom, which we'll get to when we get to his kingdom. He wants what's best for his people, and you are part of his people. So when we begin prayer, enter it not with the mindset that it's all about you, but it's about God's family and about God's story. Because we, as believers, are adopted into God's story. The Greek word here in Jesus' prayer, when we get to the word father, we go from our now to father, the word is pater. Pater, it's a Greek word. And the reason why we go into Greek and Hebrew is sometimes these words help us understand the English word doesn't quite make sense sometimes. And so in the Greek translation here, it's going to be the word pater, which means two things. It's a metaphorical meaning. It has two. There's father in the traditional sense. So the one who is, you know, the, the headship, the father, there's family. That's one sense. The other sense is this. It also has a metaphorical meaning of originator. So there's two words kind of being said here with our pater. Pater, you are the father and you're the originator. So an originator in our word would be the creator. So the beginning of Jesus' prayer begins with, hey, we are here as us and you are both our father and the beginning of all things. You are glorious for who you are. And so prayer begins nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. Prayer begins with worship to the Lord God Almighty. Prayer begins with a heart in which we are looking at our ability and we get to speak with him as father and as creator and as his kids. Now, everybody who has or has had a young child in their life, bless their hearts, they come up to you, and they do not to say to you, as let's say you're a father or mother, great father, you, great father, are my father and the originator of all of the finances at home and all the things that take care of me. May I have some milk? Our children come up to us and say, dad, 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 I want milk, 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 over and over, like, ah! I've been around kids a lot lately. You see what I'm saying? Like, there is, there is all about them and their needs, and they don't even take the time to think about the sacrifice that the parent has made to put milk into the refrigerator, to go and pour it into a cup, to watch them spill it all over the floor. Then you then go and clean it up, and you get them another milk. They take two sips. They leave it there. It curdles, and the dog gets it and pukes all over the place. (laughs) I told you I have issues. (laughs) My point being, my good friends, isn't that how we go into prayer sometimes? Dad, 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 give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. You didn't give it to me. Why didn't I get what I wanted? Stomp, stomp, stomp. See, you're not listening to me. You're not listening to me. You don't care about me. You don't love me. Stomp, stomp, stomp. We act like two-year-olds. And I'm suggesting this. Jesus has made a model for us to change our hearts right in the beginning, which is this. Dad, you are, you're the God of all of us. You're our dad, and you're the beginner of all things. God, who am I to speak to the God of the universe? You are big. You are huge. I just want to stop for a second and say thank you for everything you've done. Who am I to speak to you? What a different way to enter into prayer. Our Father. Just two words. Two words. And if we can start a prayer life in which we adore God, it's going to change the way that we're going to engage and even think to speak to him. It just simply starts with an adoration both as his greatness of what he's done for all of us, at the same time the greatness in which he he has done as our originator 
and as our Father. So here's the question. God is the God of all creation. Is he the father of people who are not in God's family? And if you're, again, newer to this kind of conversation and story, what I mean by this is this. In the Old Testament, God had a chosen people. And in the Old Testament, the way that they followed God is that they adhered to his rules and they were set apart from the rest of the people. They're a special group of people in which the Savior was going to come through, the Jewish nation or Israel. In the New Testament, we see, or the next story, the next chapter of this, we now see Jesus comes, he is God's son, and what Jesus does is he opens the door for all of humanity now to have this ability to come to God in a saving relationship. And now everybody has this chance, but now it's not about following these rules, it's about giving your life to Christ, which means Christ was the one who sacrificed his life for me because I can't do it myself. So what about the people who've never done that? Isn't God the creator of all? The answer is yes. Peter has two words. There is the originator, and then there's father. However, understanding this, what Jesus did is he fixed the relationship with our father that we can say our father. What happens with those who are outside, people who have not accepted Christ as Savior, is that those people are still in a broken relationship with him. It's still broken. It's not fixed. So through Christ, what he has done and the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me, I get to speak to God and say, hey, Father, Dad, Papa, I need to talk to you. But if I'm outside of here, he's still their father because he made them. Everybody is made in God's image. We are image bearers. But the relationship is broken. They can still talk to him. They can still reach out to him, but understand relationship broken. And what God is requiring of us to have to be in his family is relationships fixed. So as creator, yes. As father, completely different. But he still allows all of us, regardless of our status, to speak to him, which is so amazing. Because considering that the word says we're outside of God, we're enemies of God, he allows them to even still talk to him. But we who know him have this intimate inner family story of he's my, he's my dad. I'm in his family. And it's not because I said, I want to be in your family. It's because Jesus Christ fixed the brokenness. And I said, I believe in Jesus. So since I believe in him, now I get what he gets, which means I get to talk to him. That's why Jesus models this. One of the interesting components of this, the people of God, is that we have a hard time understanding something. This is a, it's a big piece. The people of God in 2024 is a big, huge thing. The word father or pater, to the ears that were listening in that day, were completely crazy. Who are you to call him father? There was not a relationship that was seen like that at that time. And that the word father, as this starts to come out, this pater, creator, originator, yet dad was a like, whoa, what is this guy saying? And so Jesus is showing the intimacy of his people, God with his people, and the intimacy being shown was very, very intentional. You may not know this, but that uncomfortableness, if you look at Islam, in Islam, they have tons of different titles or names for God, actually 99 titles or names for God in Islam. If you know anything about Islam, Islam actually has its roots in the Old Testament, has some roots there, and then branches off. And the roots that are there, and then the twisted things that come, creates a false religion that is not at all related to Christianity. Very clear. But the prophet Muhammad, as he heard and listened to the Old Testament, heard things. And so if you read the Quran, you'll see some similarities of things that are being said between the two. But you're like, ooh, that's just twisted a little bit. Ooh, that doesn't make sense ooh, they're not saying Jesus is the son of God. You start to see some twistedness that started happening, and then the worship starts going to the prophet Muhammad and to Allah versus the Lord Jesus Christ and Yahweh. And so this twistedness, as this starts to break a little bit, 99 names for God, Father is not one. Of all the titles and names, they will not use the name Father because they believe Father will lead to idolatry. Only in our Christian faith does our God Ask for intimacy and relationship. How do I know this? 
I went on a journey in college. And when I was in college, I went through most 20 sums go throughs do I really believe this? And I started to explore all sorts of world religions. I dug into all sorts of things. I just want to, I'm not just going to believe what some guy on a stage says. I want to explore. And the thing that brought me back to Christianity that says, oh my goodness, this is so amazing. Our Jesus, Yahweh, God Almighty, is the only one that loves you. The rest, you just try not to make them mad. That's the best way I can say it in like three sentences. I'm like, and this love of a creator for its creation was so emphatically different. And the call that he had to love everybody versus to cut people off was so different. Because as father and our father, this intimacy that he's calling us to is so unique. But we don't always act like that in our prayer life, in our faith life, maybe even our, our religious lives. For some, our story of religion is, I have to do this so God's not mad at me. I'm trying not to get smited by God today. If I don't go to church, bad things will happen, almost kind of like some weird like mystic thing. As opposed to God is so in love with, with us, with me, with humanity, that I want to live my life just close to him and on mission. We have turned it into... I try, God, not to be mad at me. Understand this. Our God is the only one who offers and extends love to his people. He's the only one. It's beautiful. It's perfect. And that's why we love him so much. But Jesus moves on in his prayer. He says this, our Father in heaven. Never heard a sermon for 35 minutes go on four words before, have you? Our Father in heaven. This is what's a little different now. The closeness of God, Jesus now separates us from him. Our communal dad and creator is not here. He is not you. He's not like you. He's not your homeboy. This God who is for us and loves us is now completely separated from us. He is not human. He doesn't have human limitations. He has uh, everything in control of his hands. And in the heavens, he controls stars and moons and universe and your life and the hairs of your head. He is much bigger than all of us. And so our Father, who is separate from us, is close yet set apart from us. And so the first four words creates intimacy and reverence. Our God, the tension that is there is so close yet so far. He's right here, but he's so much bigger than our human thoughts, minds, desires. He's close, but he's separate. John Stott says this really well concerning these four words. Beginning the prayer by addressing who God is and where God is located, it creates a difference between who we are and who God is. Stott writes, if he he is in reality our Father in heaven, then only then does it become possible, indeed essential, to give his concerns priority and to become preoccupied with his name, his kingdom, and his will, and not ours. So we do not enter prayer with a list of things that we're demanding this God genie to give us, which honestly is not how we enter prayer sometimes. Hey, God, um, yeah, real quick, thank you, like the two-year-old. We enter prayer with this beautiful piece of reverence And we enter prayer with this understanding that the will of God, the story of God, who God is, is all we're preoccupied with. We are obsessed in prayer to start talking to him about him. Because his glory and his majesty and his love and his sacrifice deserves a lot more than we actually offer him. And Jesus says this, when you come to him, he is your father and he is ours together. He is separate to be revered because he is great. And then Jesus says this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I use the old King James for you because that's how I memorized it. Hallowed be your name. We don't use the word hallowed a lot. It's not a big word here. But again, we'll go back to the Greek word, hagiadzo. Let's speak Greek together. One, two, three. Hagiadzo. Hagiadzo is this big Greek word and it also has multiple pieces to it. First thing is this. When we use the word hallowed, you use God's name seriously and respectfully. We don't ever say his name flippantly, kind of on the side. There's this deep seriousness and respectfulness to it. 
And the second, the hagiadzo, the other piece of this says this. The second, it's not associated with anything profane or ungodly. So we enter prayer saying, hallowed be your name. The first thing Jesus instructs believers to ask for is that your name is placed above all things, is revered, is holy, and you are so far beyond me, and I'm the guardian of that name. Let your name be lifted up above mine. In this first sentence, we have walked through this huge journey and a few words here to explore that Jesus is really serious about how we enter prayer. And obviously, he's speaking to a group of people that were doing it wrong, and he's speaking to us all these years later as we continue to do it wrong. Because when we enter prayer with this idea that I'm taking his name seriously and that his name is so special, I shouldn't even say it off my lips. Your name is so precious, God, because you love us. You're our dad. You are above all things, and your name needs to be protected. One of the things in our culture that makes the most sense to us is when someone talks junk about your mama. When, you hear, when someone starts talking junk about your family, and you're in the schoolyard, and someone says something about your mom, like, don't talk about my mom, don't talk about my mama, and you'll see little kids go fisticuff over people who talk junk about moms, or people that talk junk about their friends, or people when you start to see when people are being made fun of, mocked, spoken down about, and you see this rise up. And we say, I will protect that person's name and their reputation, and we go fisticuffs, right? Fist up, don't talk about that person negatively. That person's very special to me. Do we feel even remotely close to that when someone says, OMG? You know what OMG is. Our culture loves it. It's all over social media. Every kid says it. The flippancy in which the name of the name God is being thrown out there by us. Let's be honest many of us, because it's culturally acceptable. OMG. GD it. JC. The name of God. Now, as us as believers, we are the protectors of the name of God. And I'm not saying go out there and say, ah, don't say that, don't say that, don't say that, don't say that, because, because you need relationship to speak. But let me say this. I do not allow those words to be spoken around me because that's my master and my savior. That's my master and my savior. The Lord God has saved me. I mean, the name of God, because of him, I am who I am today, loved and still a broken mess. And if you start talking about my father that way and start talking about my savior that way, I'm going to rise up. I'm not going to punch anybody, but... I will say, will you please not say that? And that's on them. I just don't want to hear it. And I'm not trying to change that person. I don't know their story, if their background. I can't hear it. I, it burns. And I'm going to be honest with you. The more you roll through social, the more you roll through songs, the more you roll through things that are saying it all the time, honestly, you get kind of used to it. And it's like, oh, it's no big deal. But if Jesus says we enter prayer and we enter as our dad who is close to all of us, yet he is separate and wonderful, is our prayer life starting with, may your name and your glory be lifted high above anything else in the world, really changes the way you're willing to flip out OMG. It is going to start to feel like salt in a wound if you are praying the way Jesus prays. And so I think, well, we all know, the masterfulness of Jesus is teaching us that entering a prayer life in a conversation with God, with this reverence of the name of God, the reverence of his separateness, but his beautiful fatherness, creates a space in our life, in our prayer life, that's going to reflect in how we worship him in and out every single day, not just when we pray. Just because culture says it's okay, doesn't mean it's okay. Now, if you feel convicted, because I can see your faces even in the dark. Friends, this is why we're here to grow. One of the things I appreciate about the ability to coach people and, and be involved with people's lives in different aspects, both in spiritual life and in sports, is that, is that when people come with a desire to grow and they get into something, and the first thing they do is they get frustrated they haven't succeeded at something. They get frustrated. And the first thing that people want to do when they get frustrated is quit or stop. I can't do it. It's too hard. 
Let me share this with you. Growth is a, is a trajectory, and growth takes time. And so when I come here, I'm you rah rah you as coach, because I only get 35 minutes to try to get you to understand this beautiful concept here. And I don't want you to feel the guilt, shame, and weight. What I want you to feel is the Holy Spirit convicting you to say, it's time to grow, and it's time to go. Feel the weight and the joy of the Spirit releasing you believers to say, there's more for you, and there's so much awesomeness for you if you will follow me in my ways, and allow him to change you. And growth is always painful. Everybody wants to stay in what's easy. And so if you have to change patterns of prayer, patterns of words, patterns of how you think about God, it's going to be hard because you're going to want to go back to your old ways. Hear me in this. Growth takes time, and God is so patient with us. So patient. I don't know why. I'm not patient with anybody. So you're really lucky I'm not God because I'm super impatient. I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's go. But he is so patient. Growth takes time. And so when you hear a sermon like this, you can start to feel like, man, I can't do that. I don't think that way. And man, I don't pray. What is one step right now to change the way you pray? It could be this. I'm going to start talking to God as my father. It's always been about me. I'm going to say our father. You know, I'm going to start to change the way I pray and start to say, Father, I come with reverence for who you are. Your name is above me and above all things. Can I talk to you about a few things today? Start the journey of transformation. Allow there to be growth. That change is going to be hard, and change could be hurtful and painful inside of us. But understand the beauty of transformation once you get through that. And once you become a person of prayer, and once you start to see God transform you through the Spirit, watch what God can do in you and through you to transform the world. I've shared with this before with you guys. I've been in church a long time, long time, good portion of my life. I've been in ministry, doing full-time pastoral ministry for 22 years. So I've given lots of speeches. Good speech, pastor. Thank you. I've given lots of speeches. I've watched a lot of people in their journeys. I've watched people grow. I've watched people fall. This is what I see in the people of God when they are ready to go. They dig in their heels. They say, Lord, transform me. If you are not praying, you are missing the breath of your spiritual life. So if your spiritual life feels dry, I don't know where he's at, I'm not really connected, just start praying. Just start praying. And this series is going to teach you how to pray. And so if you didn't take notes, at least go back and listen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Just take that one sentence and start praying it this week as your beginning journey of transformation. And watch how your prayer life changes when you see your believers, your Father, the separateness and awesomeness of your God, who is both close yet far, and the most special, beautiful holiness of his name that we protect together. Once again, thank you so much for listening. If you live in Southeast Wisconsin, we'd love to connect with you at our weekend gathering for service time, directions, and to learn more about our vision to ignite a movement of love that transforms our community and the world. Visit us at mosaicwi.com.